one of the things uh, Jeff let me know about these sessions is that um, people have requested some time actually carved out to begin to think about how to bring this back to their own classrooms. So I'm hoping that today um, we can begin to do some concrete collaborative course planning and really capture um, some of our, um, some of the gems that we've heard in the presentations and through the conversation. Um, I just want to say I, I'm, I'm the novice in the room um, and I have so appreciated the presentations themselves and the kinds of questions you all have asked. Um, and I think some of the things we've even seen in the gestures of our presenters, beginning with a roadmap of what they're going to do, um, it's been so interesting to see um, the sort of pulling back of the curtain on disciplinary thinking. This is how a political scientist, uh, where he gets his sources and how he scrutinizes them. This is how an economist thinks about numbers. Um, I really appreciate it. We call that those think loud protocols and in, uh, in uh, my uh, teaching engagement program, we're always encouraging that kind of thing. Um, the way that you uh, each, um, the relevance of your topics is, uh, is uh, quite in all of our minds, but you've, um, you've helped um, ground us in uh, particular moments and ways of understanding the relevance of your subject matter. That's something we always tell people to do uh, in the classroom. So um, I've appreciated some of the uh, techniques we've seen from our presenters today. Um, let's see. So some of the goals I have for, um, for this session is that um, we should be able to identify something to take back to your classroom. Uh, we'll be able to translate that into a meaningful learning objective. Um, we'll consider a more elaborate learning experience framework. Uh, and we'll use some best teaching practices that you all may be very familiar with, backward design um, and transparency. But it's always a good exercise. Yeah. <laughs> backward design time is always time well spent. Sorry. All right. Really okay. So let's see. I guess the first thing I wanted to ask is, um, kind of where you are. Um, are there things that uh, you've already heard today or ideas that you've been working, uh, you've been sort of ruminating on that you're thinking, oh, this is the, something I, I know I want to bring back to the classroom? Yes. So one of the things, um, which I know wasn't a major point, but because I teach Asian religions, and one of the things that students struggle with is Confucianism, and so the idea, because we always talk about it coming from China, which is where it begins, but um, it, helping them see it as more expansive than China. Okay. And so like bringing in something that I know about but have forgotten is the view of the Vietnamese versus the Chinese. Okay. You know, that southern, northern. Oh, right. Is there view. a true Confucianism yeah. or who has more access to right. it? Right. And, yeah. and helping them see this as, as something bigger than one of the things I'm always trying to break apart for my students is that current political realities are not historic. And so that, that whole picture too. Okay. Yeah. Today is only for today. Yeah. I love that current political reality is not historic. Um, anybody else working on an idea or something that you've heard that you know you want to bring back? Well, I, I can say a couple things. Um, for one thing, coming to these things, what it does is just expand my own knowledge. I feel like it gives me a little more repertoire that I bring into the room, even if it isn't just that one topic I'm going to specifically teach about. But, but for instance, I mean, just just Mel Grutov's um, list mm -hmm. right at the beginning, where are Koreans, North Koreans, coming from? I mean, just making that into a list. I mean. I have presented something like this, but I liked your list a lot. I thought it was real clarifying, mm -hmm. you know. And um, I don't think that most of most people, un until they've been, you know, delving into this stuff, would have any idea. Most Americans mm -hmm. would know that. So you know, I I feel like I'm going to use some of these notes, um, you know, and just to sort of expand or focus my own lectures okay. or, or talks about that. Okay, so the, the notion of a list of options um, for response. Well, like, well, and maybe even the and maybe even the exact list. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. mean, just this list: militant nationalism, yeah. trust of the outside world, insecurity, and need for international respect. I knew those things. 
but it was just kind of helpful to have it presented that yeah. way, and I think I, I'm going to take some of that back. Yeah, I think that's a great idea, and even having, I can imagine a lot of uh, sort of um, somewhat playful ways of bringing the, the notion of choice into the classroom. I really liked the, um, so the president goes with option B, or um, what do you, um, yeah, where are you drawn in a list of, in a finite list of, of, of problematic choices? It seemed like students could get involved there too. Uh, anybody else have a? I have a sort of a quandary that as my uh, sense of the complexity of any one issue gets larger, um, I don't know how to get students. They don't want to read that much. Okay. And they usually, yeah. <laughs> they usually get overwhelmed yeah. um, because they don't know that much. And so uh, there's a gap between kind of what I want them to, to get at and uh, what they're kind of willing to take on. Uh -huh. um, so it came up with the whole concept of um, what's going on with factories and uh, labor unions and labor codes. It's important to get at that complexity, but I don't know how to do that with my students. Right, how to motivate them to get into the work of... I don't even know how to present it in a, yeah. a non-overwhelming, coherent fashion. Yeah. Because it's only one... We teach general courses, survey courses, and so it has, it's just one little sliver. Yes. And then you have to move on. Uh -huh. um, so that's a question I have. And remind me of your discipline. So I teach that in a writing class. Um, it's a writing 122 class. Okay. But it doesn't really matter. I mean, yeah. I, I, I run into this, when I teach international studies, I run into the same a week is the most I can give anything. Uh -huh. So how do you get at the complexity of anything in yeah. a week? Yeah, but there's got, it seems like there has to be some way to motivate students out of classroom work um, so you can make the most of the right. time with them in class. Um, I'm just thinking through things like reacting to the past games or the where the, the argument of having students do a role-playing game is they put so much more into it because they are invested in the game itself or because they've, they've taken on some kind of persona. Um, but I, I think that's a... Are a lot of people thinking about how to move this material into a survey course and so... Um, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. That's what we all do. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so um, you may be choosing moments in the survey course where um, you're uh, moving through uh, history or whatever your topic is, but you're going to have some drill down moments or some case studies where um, you, you have some, um, some moments of depth alongside of the breath. And so there might be something here where um, this is where you're going to do a case study or this is where you're going to do a, you know, maybe just a one day or a two day role play game or something that changes the, the flow of the class. Hmm. Um, in order to bring something out for them a little bit more. So it does seem like this kind of material might be a place to disrupt the, uh, disrupt, disrupt the breath for um, some depth. Um, thank you for raising that. It sounds like that's a really, um, that's going to be an important issue for us. It's always an issue, I yeah. think. Well, I'm toying also with, um, can we call you Marty? Please. Marty, <laughs> you know, that with the article that you wrote, and I haven't quite figured out how to put that in the class mm -hmm. yet, but I'm thinking, sometimes I do things as an option, um, but say I were to take that, like maybe right. we could take that as a project, you know, and how would we bring that article into the classroom and um, what to do with it, you know? Um, and because I've heard you speak, you know, I can make it more personal, like, I met this guy, I was really, <laughs> you know, and, and, it, and I, I know that those kinds of things do make it more immediate for students, and then, and on, he lives around, do you live around here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you can say whatever makes a good story. <laughs> you know, and, but, but I am thinking of, of doing that, and I, I don't know if it's going to be too hard for them or not. You think it'll be too hard well, for I mean, uh, students? Can I say something? Please. Um, you know, there's there's different levels, uh -huh. and like you're saying, but I mean, one level is, you know, is Asia. We, we hear in the news of Asia being, you know, such this dominant thing. Well, you know, 
here's just an, an insight that maybe it's not quite as much as it looks like. Or we talk about these big countries, but what about workers? How do we understand what's happening to workers? So even those big concepts that kind of go against the flow that most people have, Asia rules, or Asia's our enemy, or we yeah. just think of countries and suddenly introduce relationship or perspective of labor, what's really happening to workers in those countries allows us to just sort of show this outline that even if students can't recreate, they go back with a different framework mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and are then therefore more receptive to when they read something in the newspaper, mm -hmm. be aware of it. So I don't think on all of these things, you know, I mean, obviously I teach a course on economic development or on political economy East Asia, I can, you know, do things, but I think even in any course, um, you know, we're working against the grain in a way yeah. of sort of making it alive and bringing in a different perspective. Do they get all these exports and we hear them all, does that mean automatically our life is better off? What about the U.S.? We have all, you know, would we say everybody, well, you know, just sort of laying, the, I'm just kind of repeating myself now, but just sort of laying the groundwork of a different way to understand things, even if you're not going to be able to go through everything. Yeah. No. Um, further on that, you know, uh, think about what uh, Marty was um, offering as examples of the commodity chain uh, production. Barbie doll. <laughs> Barbie doll. <laughs> but, but you could make it even more local. Um, take the Nike sneaker. You know? <laughs> There's plenty of information out there on what that entails in terms of the product, uh, how it's created, how it's marketed, how it's produced, the impact on workers in Vietnam and other uh, China and, uh, and other production sites. Um, and you can, you know, you can weave a story around a common product. Yeah. Um, you know, in teaching international studies years ago, uh, I, I also tried to relate that to a, a project for the students, um, as uh, which I called Global Portland. Global, Global Portland. 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 Yeah, that's that. City that's right that right here. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and the idea was to get students, you know, as a in lieu of a, the usual kind of term paper, to get them to go out into this community because, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's international that goes on here, and, and get them to investigate the, the international aspect of labor issues, environmental issues, uh, production issues like Nike and other firms that are doing business abroad. Um, so, you know, the, the more you can relate it to something familiar, um, and, and expose the fact that, oh, you know, this product, this sneaker, <laughs> is an international product, you know, and all the automobiles you're driving are international products. Uh, so okay. that's just a thought. Yeah, I love the concreteness and immediacy of that idea. It's, um, and even in um, the way that some of that material was presented, um, Marty, I'm thinking of you, uh, several times reading to us from different newspaper articles, or it's like you're showing us your sources as you went, and I could imagine that, um, you know, if those sources were distributed around the room, and so you're telling a story, um, you know, they've read the article for, uh, before they come into class, um, you're telling a story, but you're also deconstructing where does an economist get their information, and the students have some of the source material too. Um, yeah, thank you all. Um, I think um, already uh, we're hearing in some of uh, some of these responses. Um, the interest is not on what I'm going to teach, but um, is it Martha? You were already thinking about. Well, the, the thing I want students to learn is that um, current politics, and political realities, are not historical ones, or they're often quite quite new, and so. Um, um, many of us go into teaching a uh, class thinking of these are the these are the texts I'm going to teach, um, but uh, shifting that uh, focus to what I want my students to learn is of course the, the first step in a backward design process. And so I thought maybe today we could try to write a couple of learning objectives, um, and then um, and then try to tie them to a, an assignment idea. Yeah. So I'm teaching an exploring identity and diversity course okay. next term, and so I'm, what I really appreciated was this discussion about nationalism. Okay. Because I feel like students also don't bring into the awareness of what nationalism actually entails and the historical relevancy to that. And so I appreciate that, first of all. But yeah, uh -huh. so just bringing that into nice. how that can be maybe the foundation of 
the first discussion or just like I, I'd like it to be the first discussion, but maybe later on. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, so nationalism might be the first thing you teach. And you said it's a political... Oh, it's a, it's a college readiness career guide. It's, it's, um, the course is Exploring Identity and Diversity. Uh-huh. So this concept of nationalism is perfect. Yeah. Uh, what is that? Yeah. Start, start with the U.S. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. I think one of our challenges is that most of us are teaching really different disciplines. Yes. You know, like April's teaching biology. Mm -hmm. Can you take something like this to your class? Really differently. I mean, I am trying to teach my students all about environmental issues and why do they exist and how, like, sometimes they're just like, why does that country pollute like that? Why do they take our e-waste? Why did you know, they don't understand how that fits into politics and economics and all, everything. And so that context, I'm trying, I, I can gain a lot from this kind of a talk. I know it seems really tangential, but it, it actually fits in really well to stuff that my students need to understand better and I need to understand better. And because I really was only trained <laughs> as a biologist. Mm -hmm. But just to understand the political and the culture and the histories and what's current and why this is difficult uh, to address. Mm -hmm. And how would we go about addressing it? Because even in our own country, going local, mm -hmm. my students are like, oh, why can't we fix this environmental issue? Just decide this now. Yeah. And it's bigger than that, you know? Uh -huh. It's like, you know, that's not with code right now. You know, and so, you know, yeah. it's, just, <laughs> it, it's just that, but they don't know all those little pieces, so it helps me to see all these little pieces. Not that I can teach everything here, yeah. but uh, it, it is helpful, uh, and, and, and so, but yeah, yeah, you're right, making an assignment that's specific that I'm going to get in there. I think I can just look at environmental issues and trying to get in some of the, the understanding of the politics and the histories and the culture and the nationalism that may affect how that environmental issue manifests for different groups or countries, depending on what we're looking, if we're looking at an Nike shoe or whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that's also the place where we say, and if you're interested in more of this, take a class in... Yeah this area or that area. <laughs> yeah. uh, but your courses and these classes aren't intro to biology. They're, they're, they're science and policy. Yeah, the kind the, of the environmental are, studies part is easier. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But then even in um, biology, one of our biggest things is population growth. Mm -hmm. And there's certainly history and cultural yeah. and, you know, yeah. all sorts of political systems. China is actually great. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and it's interesting because my students really don't understand why China has this, or has had this policy since 1980 that's slightly changed. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they just think of them as this horrible country that controls everything, you know. <laughs> and, um, and so it's good for them to get more perspective yeah. on why, how, yeah, what it does to the country yeah. and the culture and the migrant workers and, you know, mm -hmm. all that. I mean, they don't know anything about any of that. Yeah. And so I think it's huge. And unfortunately, you're right. I mean, I can only spend this amount of time on everything. Yeah. But sometimes you can build it into projects that they research different parts. And so it's just setting up a structure that I can get them to hit some of these components that I'm not hitting as much as I should be. Yeah. Or as much as is possible. Or as much as I want to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know. There's that idealism in us. <laughs> and if you have any suggestions, um, what April said reminded me, I feel like I spend half the term fighting ethnocentrism, getting really mad and sad and depressed. <laughs> um, it comes up all the time in millions of different ways. Yes. Yeah. So. Uh, I don't really know what to do about it except just keep fighting. Yeah. I mean, I'm imagining something like a pre-class survey where you get some of those views out onto the table, maybe even before you've even met as a group. Um, so they've, they've answered some questions through a Qualtrics survey or something, and then you bring it in on the first day um, and, and make the, sort of characterize some of what you've seen. Um, and also, you know, not in a way that, um, that confronts them on the first day of class with how wrong they are. Um, <laughs> um, but in a way that says, you know, guess what? I, we have something, um, some exciting work to do together. Or even if one of your if one of your goals for the class, sometimes like people have a goal, like we're going to broaden our uh, perspective um, to um, um, to imagine the views of others. 
Um, so that's a learning objective for the class. And on the student survey, they say, do you care about these goals? Do they sound good to you? And students say, yeah, like that sounds great. I do want to broaden my perspective. And then when you hit on that kind of thing, you can say, remember how we all said we wanted to work toward this. This is when we're doing that. Um, so I don't know, if you've got something that's a persistent misconception or problem, um, finding some kind of strategic way to bring it into the room, or even playing a believing doubting game or something to get them to practice practice shifting perspectives or inhabiting a different perspective um, and then talking about that experience might be might be helpful um, you're all I'm sure familiar with Bloom's taxonomy um, um, working its way up usually this is presented as a pyramid people go from understanding up up up, up to the, the pyramid to being able to create new things and ideas um, I'm less fond of uh, Bloom's taxonomy than this uh, uh, LD Fink's taxonomy of significant learning. Um, the reason I love this, uh, it, it builds on foundational knowledge, what do you know, how can you apply it, but it also starts to get into these holistic goals around how do you connect the thing that you're learning to the rest of your life, to another class, uh, to your family's experience. Um, what are the personal and social stakes of what we're learning? Um, I, I actually want you to care about something more. Um, I want you to learn to be a better learner. So um, I think access to bring these kind of goals um, from our hearts out onto the syllabus and into the conversation of the classroom. And I think once, uh, once you have a goal for student learning that is explicit about um, something like this, it starts to lead to some interesting assignments, right, as you align uh, the kinds of assessments with those goals. So, um, this is another thinky, uh, LD think uh, kind of prompt. Um, what impact do you want to make on your students that um, lasts far beyond the course? Um, so he's trying to get people to think um, past 10 weeks to what is the, the transformation and how our students um, think, act, and feel. Um, so just to um, sort of refresh our memories about uh, the genre of a learning objective, <laughs> these are succinct <laughs> statements. Uh, they have a verb in them. My students uh, will be able to, should be able to do something. Um, usually it's measurable um, to some degree. Um, it's written in ideally for students. Um, in other words, um, I look at a lot of these for uh, in my role as the TEP director, and some of them are awful. They're so bureaucratic, it sound, or um, jargon filled. It doesn't sound like a real thing. There's no, there's no beauty or interest there. Um, but ideally, it should be something that students could say. Yeah, I've been learning this thing and it sounds it's real it's really important so <laughs> ideally a good student learning objective sounds like a real thing <laughs> um, let's see so these are some sample goals um, my students will be able to analyze American public and political rhetoric for uh, ways it relies on tropes and stereotypes connect the concerns of imaginative works imagining we taught a literature or a pop culture class to ongoing debates in East Asian political and cultural life. Seek out research and cultural production of East Asian scholars and artists. There's no voices on a syllabus or in a public discussion or homogenously Western. I'm just trying to think of a learning to learn kind of goal. Um, be more curious about the world and other people. I mean, there's a real think kind of goal. Um, caring, caring about something, um, working toward a, a human dimension, people's learning. Um, this is my a uh, colleague in the teaching development world, Peter Felton at Elon University. Um, he teaches a study abroad uh, class in Istanbul, and um, one of the learning objectives for that class was uh, that he wanted students to be more curious. They just were um, a co-taught course, and it felt like students just weren't they were asking good questions or something about um, learning to be curious uh, had passed them by, <laughs> so they wanted to double down on uh, developing students' curiosity. Um, and sure enough, this is uh, the American Association of Colleges and Universities rubric for intercultural knowledge and competence, and curiosity is one of the um, um, ask complex questions about other cultures, seeks out and articulates answers to those questions that reflect multiple cultural perspectives. 
curiosity. Um, to help students develop their curiosity, they did a journal writing exercise where at least four times a day, students wrote a paragraph or two about questions that are on their minds at the moment. This is a study abroad trip. But wow, what an in-your-face assignment. It's easy, right? You're just writing questions, uh, but you're doing it a lot. Um, and then eventually going back to that journal um, and writing an essay about how the questions um, were changing. They had their students do a positive psychology center uh, quiz kind of uh, on curiosity at the beginning of term. Put the envelope uh, results in an envelope, <laughs> gave them back at the end of term to look again and see uh, uh, for students to see how their um, their answers might have changed. I'm going into some detail here because um, I think um, I mentioned that uh, a backward design um, course would have a learning objective that would be linked to an assignment. We're going to do that together, um, but those uh, learning objectives can be interesting ones that are really uh, get at the heart of what you're passionate about in your teaching. Um, and something like curiosity might seem like, well, how am I ever going to? What is the assignment that's going to align with that? But I really like seeing uh, this example of how even a very idealistic um, uh, learning objective can link to some actual uh, assignments. Hmm. Inventory. Oh, it's at the University of Pennsylvania has um, uh, this positive psychology center has probably seventy five of these kinds of um, these kinds of personal inventories and quizzes to assess attitudes. Is it online? Yeah. It just I, it strikes me as being really useful. Yeah. Philosophy class. Oh, um, good. She'll give us her presentation. Yeah, I know, but I want to be oh, able to go well. to that location. <laughs> and, yeah. Okay, so um, this is activity one for our time together. Um, I wanted to ask you to maybe, um, you've already said some wonderful things about um, what you'd like to bring back to the classroom. I wonder if you could maybe turn, uh, turn what you said into one or two learning objectives. Um, on this handout, um, You've got a, a sort of little backward design matrix. My students should be able to dot, 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 then um, complete that sentence. And I think the real challenge here is if, you, uh, if you're willing to, maybe try to do uh, at least one um, from LG Think's more holistic categories, like integration, interdimension, caring, and learning to know. Okay, so we're going to write one or two of these things, and if, uh, if the think thing resonates with you, maybe try to make one, one of yours um, from one of these more holistic categories. Okay? Has everybody had a chance to write something? Great. Would anybody be willing to share um, one, of your, one of your student learning objectives? Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I don't like my, my, my language because I don't have time for really work on it, but um, reflect on how historical changes in belief systems, particularly as outside belief systems come in and impose on local systems, influence um, people's lives. Okay. All right. So how um, belief systems and also the sort of constraint and Pressure on belief systems from outside forces change people's lives. Okay. Yes. Um. <laughs> and I actually do talk about that. Yeah. Um, anybody else willing to share um, a goal for student learning that might be based uh, in part of what you've heard today? Oh, thank you, Roberta. My students should be able to develop an inquiry-based research question. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> so that, that involves the whole curiosity. Uh -huh. curiosity the world is something big and not too scary. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, I think that's cool. Yeah, I like that one too. When thinking about the, the time issue, or um, mm -hmm. somebody said that, um, was it you, Martha, that said, like, this is how projects are helpful, or what's happening out of class is really helpful. Um, but maybe there's a way that, um, yeah, by developing um, a good question and pursuing it, uh, they can be bringing something back into the classroom. Um, that drives the discussion forward. Yeah, good. Um, anybody else willing to share an example? Yeah, thanks, Lisa. We talk a lot about the socio ecological model and how that in fact uh, impacts health choices. And so, um, based on what we were talking about today, being able to apply that in a more global way. Okay. So students understand they don't have enough money to buy fresh fruits and vegetables, but they might not understand the bigger context of like trade policies and impact on like prices of food in the food chain and how that impacts their choices. So okay. Just getting more global with things that relate back to our personal health. Okay, great. So um, yeah, I love that. that sort of health and well well being kind of conversations can be so um, so personal, the title of the course is personal health, so, so personal and so uh, seemingly local and individual that you're broadening, broadening that individual context to a global context. scale. That's great. Um, all right, let's, um, let's keep with the backward design matrix here and then if you could link one, um, one assignment to one of your goals, what is an assignment you might do? Uh, to, um, to assess whether or not your students are uh, beginning to achieve uh, the goal that you've set for them. I think we'll take about, um, maybe about five minutes, maybe a little bit less to write that assignment. And I, um, ideally, um, for what we're gonna do um, after this, um, it would be good if it was a higher stakes kind of assignment, something that might require some out of state, uh, out of class work, um, rather than just a daily activity. Um, so if you could um, spend a little bit of time thinking about what this assignment that would help you see students um, learning towards your goal um, would be, we're gonna do some work in, um, in trios then to talk about those assignments. <laughs> So, so what I'd like to do now is for you to um, um, talk with some colleagues about your assignment. And don't tell them your big goal. Tell them about the assignment you have in mind. And then colleagues, I'd like for you to, uh, to uh, offer back what you think the purpose of the assignment is. Oh, that's clever. And what the first thing, <laughs> what the first thing that you would do if you were given that assignment. Okay, so um, we don't have a ton of time, so I think we'll probably um, reconvene in about 15 minutes. So uh, we'll be in groups of three. I think that should be enough time for everybody to be able to say their assignment idea and get feedback from two, um, maybe here, here, and here. Um, and get, um, gather, I have lots of space. Feedback from colleagues <laughs> about what they think the purpose is and how they would go about doing it. And I mean, literally, like, if you gave me that assignment, the first thing I would do is go to the library. Or the first thing I would do is Google what, what that word means, because I do not even know. Okay, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, and I think we've got some, um, these are all multidisciplinary groups, too, which is good, because um, <laughs> sometimes we don't. Um, uh, any of us are from the same are, Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, you, you've got a very mixed crowd. Yeah. <laughs> because you've just come up with this assignment idea, right? Um, so I'll, I'll acknowledge that. Uh, um, okay. When we, we've been doing these workshops uh, with faculty at U of O, and of course they, they're bringing in an assignment that they've taught before, and it's a pretty established thing. So here you are working with a very fledgling idea. Um, but I wonder if anybody discovered uh, any misconceptions about what the purpose or the, um, or the process might be. We were damn good over here. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't quite finish yours. 
Oh. <laughs> um, what we're working uh, with is um, it's actually a part of your um, your handout here, the transparent assignment template. Um, this is from UNLV's Marianne Winklemas. Have you seen this before? Um, they're doing a lot of research, uh, um, led by Marianne nationally, on this um, format for student assignments, um, where faculty are upfront about the purpose, the task, and the criteria for evaluation before students do any work. Um, so the assignment sheet itself includes these now. things. Um, the purpose is meant to um, be a broad purpose, like um, the purpose of this assignment is to help you practice the following skills that are essential to your success in this course, in school, in the field, in professional life beyond school. Um, in other words, they're thinking of um, uh, it's a good thing in transparent assignment design if you can say what the larger um, motivating purpose of the assignment is. Um, uh, their research has found that this is a real, um, not only does this um, transparent assignment template um, boost student performance, um, and especially uh, the performance um, from uh, students in historically underrepresented groups, but uh, one of the things it also does is increase students' sense of social belonging, which was surprising to them as a finding, but apparently understanding what your faculty want from you um, and not sitting in the back feeling like, I don't belong here, um, and interpreting um, one's confusion as meaning, I don't belong here, um, actually does have um, benefits for students' sense of their um, sense of themselves in the institution. Um, so. Uh, the results have been so good from the transparent assignment template that now this is one of the things that we just tell U of O faculty to use. Like usually when we have teaching development workshops, we say, oh, well, here's an idea. Use it, don't use it. Now we say, you should use it. <laughs> just, just do it. Why not? Because it's such a small lift uh, to put these things forward before students do work. Um, and it, you'll find, um, if you're interested in this, um, they also have a transparent assignment uh, sheet that student student facing or the audience for the students as a self-advocacy piece. Um, so if you're in an, in an advising role um, or a library role, you could say to students, well, you know, did your faculty member talk to you about what the purpose and the task at hand um, are? Or have you, what, what were the, what is your faculty member looking for? Go ask them. <laughs> um, and so um, their goal is for every incoming student at UL and they'll be to see that. Um, that template and to be able to ask those questions. Um, okay. <laughs> so, um, we've just got about 10 minutes left, and I um, wanted to introduce this um, learning experience framework from Jose Antonio Bowen. Um, he is the president of Goucher College, um, and he's also uh, a voice in the future of head, higher education kind of debates. Uh, his work, Teaching Naked, uh, gets cited a lot. Um, that book is about um, getting technology out of the way of the in-person learning experience, but using it in all kinds of creative ways to um, to drive student learning outside of class. Um, anyway, he uh, came to U of O in June and uh, gave quite a provocative uh, talk about um, the transitioning faculty role from content expert um, to designer of learning experiences. Um, he sh showed video after video of experts giving lectures and uh, was making a, um, an argument that will be familiar to many of us now that um, the thing uh, that many of us have to offer is not our expertise alone, but how we help students engage uh, with, our, with our expertise. Um, and so he was um, asking us to think about um, this framework about um, how to bring students, draw them in, to, um, to your goals for their learning. Um, in other words, uh, make their goals for themselves your goals. <laughs> How do those things come together? Um, here, let's look at it this way. What matters most to your students? Motivate their engagement. Um, 
be aware of what content is available online, uh, find the gems, um, and add analysis. Um, in other words, uh, he's making the argument that students, um, rather than read the long book that you've assigned for them, will Google your topic. Um, and not only will they Google your topic, but then they'll uh, limit the search results to videos of short duration. <laughs> um, so the idea is to figure out what's out there uh, on your topic, and then um, maybe that can be a way for you to show, hey, this topic, people are making videos and talking about this topic. What did they forget? <laughs> um, how can we, um, why is this, um, um, why doesn't this use all the tools that we've been using in our class? Or, in other words, uh, kind of um, be aware of the content-rich um, environment that we're teaching in and think through how students are first meeting, um, meeting your content. Um, before you see students in class, um, you might do something like have them take a quiz. Uh, take a quiz online so that you can um, be assured that they've done the reading or done some work to prepare for class. Now you don't have to repeat the reading in class, you can do something more interesting in class. Right? Um, they could even do something like create an assignment as class preparation. Um, and then when they come to class, um, you can change the game of that, um, of their expectations uh, of what they've prepared. So in other words, um, identify the most controversial claim in an article. Maybe that's the pre-class assignment. So they're going to take a quiz before class to show that they read something. And then they're going to write a short little thing saying, uh, this was the most controversial claim in the article. Or maybe this is the weakest claim in the article. Or this is the most problematic claim. And when they come to class, their job is to take that and argue it to their peers. Um, they weren't expecting that, right? Uh, they thought they were showing a deficit in the article. Uh, but now, actually, they've been asked to take on that perspective. Um, What's the rationale? The Switch. rationale is to use the class time for something surprising to happen. Um, that, that there's no, um, the time we have in person with our students is the precious thing. Um, and so that is the place where um, it is a, it's a loss if all you're doing is presenting content to them. Um, the sort of thrill of coming together and having something interesting happen is why they're there. So if you can get them to do some work ahead of time and also uh, create a surprise when they come to class, um, he thinks that's a good Thinks that's a good thing. Um, cognitive wrappers. Once they've done this thing, ask them about their own, uh, how they've done. Um, ask them about um, what did you think you lost points on? How did you spend your time in preparation uh, for this assignment? Um, what do you think will be valuable um, in this assignment moving forward in other assignments or in your life? Um, so they do work, and then you uh, get more bang for um, their labor on that assignment by asking them to reflect on their learning. And then he's a big fan of uh, emailing or Twitter, <laughs> using uh, Twitter after class um, to say, you know, I've been thinking more about thing X. Um, or it really, um, when somebody said thing Y, um, it was really surprising and it reminded me of blank, which I want to continue to think about. Um, in other words, um, rather than letting the topic close, there's this um, lingering afterlife for, for the topic because you suggest, you, uh, you continue to bring up something that's happened in class um, and you're also modeling how somebody continues to leave ideas open, uh, that you're still thinking about something, you're still reevaluating something, you're still inspired by something, you're still making a connection to something. So uh, class time uh, in person is precious. Um, how we bring students into the material, um, how we um, uh, get them to do some work ahead of time so that we can use uh, our precious time well, and then how we uh, get them to continue to reflect um, and how we model our own thought processes and the afterlife of our ideas after class. That is, um, in a nutshell, what this whole learning experience framework is. And I think that um, these pieces, the cognitive wrapper, the entry point, and 
how to get students to prepare for class actually really are worth reflecting on. What is the first, um, the first exposure to something that draws students in? Can I um, ask a question about cognitive wrappers? I had read another article um, that woman who's published a bunch of research on the um, expansive mindset. You want to help me out here? You know, the learning mindset. Oh. Uh, Carol something, yeah. right? The okay. person at Stanford, right. Carol Dweck. So. Yeah, that, <laughs> okay. her. Okay, um, so I tried using learning wrappers um, after a test. Uh, to like say to the students like how how do you think you could have studied differently and it it wasn't entirely successful because um, the responses I kind of got were like oh well I did all this stuff you know here's the list of like did you rewrite your notes or whatever or well I don't have time to do that or so uh -huh. like what is there a better way to frame the learning process questions to uh, encourage change? I found, I found the same thing. Mm -hmm. I've tried this and it's bombed yeah. most, most times as far as they don't seem to learn genuinely from it. Because it seems like a fake thing, like it just seems like no an add-on. I've been doing it for like two years now and it's, I'm already thinking of dropping it because I can't see the benefit from it. Mm -hmm. so maybe we're doing it. Well, yeah. <laughs> so that's what I'm trying to figure out. Does any has anybody had success with this, and what was their way of tweaking it? Because it, what I've tried, it, it doesn't seem like it's working. But yeah. I like the concept, so, but I'm trying to figure out how to work it. This right. summer, I was teaching a basic math class, and we focused on the story problems. And frequently, they got things wrong in the way they prepared in the homework. So we discussed when we got the wrong answers. It's like. How did you get the wrong answer? Why do you think you may have got the wrong answer? What wrong turn did you make? And how will this help you the next time you see a problem? What will you identify to avoid taking the wrong turn and coming to the wrong answer? So you're having a group discussion? Mm -hmm. So how do you have a group discussion without calling out the like, oh, so you flunked this test. Would you like to tell everybody what you did wrong? <laughs> it's it's, it's <laughs> all basic skills. So people are already coming. They're saying, well, I'm here because I don't know this stuff. Okay. And so we. You know, we I had I'd assigned different people to write their answer on the board, and then I'd ask, did anybody get any different answers? They'd volunteer with those answers, where I'd put them up, then we'd go over the problem, whatever the right answer. Then we say, now let's look at the wrong answer. How did you get there? Okay. Why would, you, especially with story problems, why might you have gotten there? If you're, you're going to have this on the, on the GED test, what kind of things do you need to be look out look out for to not fall into that trap? That's and, very specific. Mm -hmm. And so that was really helpful specific. to students because they started seeing what ways, what things do I have to look at? How do I have to analyze the way I'm reading the story problem? Mm -hmm. What traps are they setting for me? And so because they have this GED test coming up, mm -hmm. being able to say you know, they've got something else where um, mastering this thing is going to matter on. So maybe that's we why they care. very beginning a bit more. of it because it was a very, very basic math. They probably have two terms of math after that still. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I'm thinking is that if this just feels like a nothing assignment, like I scribbled it and then I handed it in and then that was that. Um, but if, um, then maybe, I don't know, maybe then they wouldn't be giving their full effort to it. But I wonder if something like um, they hand it in and then on the next assignment you say, okay, you know, you thought you wanted to work on, or you give that back to them and say, um, what is one thing from here that you worked on? Here because I'm going to look for that specifically in my feedback to you. Um, I have a colleague in the English department who um, has students at the top of the paper say, here's, a, here's the thing I was trying to improve from the last time. So they hand it in and then there's this thing written on the top of the paper and then that becomes an important part of her feedback. Um, so something that has a, a little bit more of a life to it um, is one thought for how to get more out of that. Um, It's interesting. Um, like what it might look like to do something like that through a, um, an anonymous survey feature where then you reflected some of the responses back to the group. Um, ask, like if you ask the question like how much time did you spend on the paper? That can be a really divisive, you know, the answers to that can be really illuminating. <laughs> um, because if everybody spent two hours um, and then somebody spent eight, um, I don't know, I, um, 
like a self-reporting food diary too like you mm -hmm. don't know how accurate that really is right it felt like i spent eight hours but there was that time i was on my cell phone for like an hour yeah. and <laughs> i was working on it while i was watching netflix yeah i mean i think that's hours. i think it's really hard to know like when when do you feel the burn you know like, when you've done enough labor that you should be seeing results what is the right unit of labor for um, for preparation, and that's all invisible to students. How much somebody else spends, what you, the labor you spent writing the sample paper. <laughs> like if it took you three times as long to write the sample paper and you're the professor, um, that, that shows them uh, how long it takes and what the expectations are. So I wonder about doing something anonymous like that that gets at what the assumptions are about people, the, the process that they used, that maybe that would be an interesting that, that would feel like something else was coming out of the cognitive wrapper. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you. I didn't mean yeah. to sidetrack the whole discussion. But. Yeah. No, that's. Yeah. I appreciate the um, the thought. So the um, yes. Um, do you mind if I talk for about uh, three more minutes? No. Yeah, I'm a little bit over my time now. No, but, no, um, no. But then let's maybe focus on the entry point idea. Um, so you've now got a goal. You've got an assignment link to it. Um, how do you think you might introduce this in a way um, that would motivate students learning? <laughs> how do you think you might sync up what you care about with what they care about. Some of the goals you've written may be an easy sell. Right? And students can quickly see the value in that goal. Um, some of them might be um, really profound goals that, um, that they didn't even recognize for themselves until they had the opportunity to <clears throat> class. How do you motivate their engagement with what you want them to um, Learn. Does anybody have any ideas about that? Some classes I have started, this is for philosophy, I will start with an actual physical demonstration of something that illustrates a kind of thinking, mm -hmm. something that they can connect with, okay. so then we can go from, uh, this is sort of interesting, and then move into the deeper concepts. Okay. So I guess what's um, sort of implicit there is that there's something abstract about um, philosophy that's hard for them to, that, that, yeah. that may be alienating. Um, and so you, the first thing you do is reverse that into something very concrete. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So that, that and, and it doesn't have to be something that they're, they're passionate about. It's just kind of, oh, this is interesting. You know, we're starting with this. I do one where we're talking about how we develop concepts where I take two uh, vessels, one of which is tall and thin and one of which is short and fat, mm -hmm. and young children think the tall one is going to hold more, and the tall one I have deliberately hold less, and so I take, I have the stuff in the, in the short one, and I pour, and I have it set up. So I pour into the small one and it overflows, yeah. and then we talk about where do we get these ideas from, okay. and then we move into, you know, but it's, it, it's like the chemistry professor used to do when I was in college. They do the explosion and stuff to get people interested in chemical concepts. Okay. Yeah, and also for especially those of us who teach gen ed kind of classes, students may have problematic misconceptions about the class and the discipline that, that you need to overcome. And so I'm just thinking something like writing a what is philosophy, who is a philosopher kind of um, free writes on the first day um, might give you a chance to bring some of that like, oh, oh actually, um, uh, actually, a chance to bring those misconceptions out and then uh, provide, do that demonstration and provide a contrast that it's, um, it's a discipline that's going to help you see the world in a different way, in a very concretely different way. Yeah. Anybody else have any ways that they've tried to um, motivate student learning? So we want students to know what a reliable topic is, and then kind of the external motivation is your top, you know, your sources need to be something that your instructors are going to respect. But the internal motivation would be to talk about social media. Mm -hmm. you know, something shows up in your feed and it's interesting. 
how, how you know if you can trust it. And and they, they've all had that experience of seeing that. Okay. You know, and it, it's kind of the same thing that yeah. you, you, you do, you know, try to figure out what the process would be. Right. And they, they kind of realize, oh, you know, I, I got nothing okay. <laughs> for the most part. And so then right. you talk about the process with something that means something to them and then kind of translate that into something that their instructors are they're about to a different type of source. Oh, that's a great example. All right, so I guess my challenge to you as you're thinking about how you'll frame um, your, your goal and the assignment that you're developing is thinking about, okay, how am I gonna get them excited about this? How do I figure out what they're interested in and link up this work to what they're interested in? Um, how can I do something uh, um, around the assignment that makes um, some special use of our time together? And how can I extend their learning at the end? Those are the sort of three points that I think are, uh, are meaningful. Thank you so much for your time and attention, especially at the end of the day. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.